Well, good morning. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. Reverend William Godfrey is a graduate of the seminary. He's also an adjunct professor here in practical theology and is the pastor of Christ URC in Santee. And it is our pleasure to welcome you this morning, brother. Thank you for coming and bringing us the word. I think I just got promoted. I thought I was a guest lecturer. Apparently now I'm an <laughs> adjunct professor. Hopefully my head will fit out the door when it's time to leave. Um, I'm glad to be here with you and to be able to open God's Word together. I'm gonna look, I want to look together at Judges chapter 16, uh, verses 15 through 31. Uh, Judges 16, verses 15 through 31. Uh, and that's part of the Samson story. And I wanted to consider this as one of the great reversals in Scripture. So I'm going to begin reading from God's Word in Judges 16, beginning at verse 15. And I'm going to read through the end of the chapter. Let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own Word. This passage starts as Delilah has already been deceived by Samson a few times about the source of his strength. And this is finally where he tells her the truth. And she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god and to rejoice. And they said, Our god has given Samson our enemy into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their god. For they said, Our god has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison. And he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, Let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me. And please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. When his brothers and all his family, then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Let's pray and ask God to open it to us. Our Father in heaven, your word is truth, but we know we need you to guide us into all truth. So we ask that you would open our eyes by the power of your spirit that we might behold wondrous things out of your word. And most of all, we would see Jesus. Hear us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> 
Well, when Reverend Tedrick sent out an email about this series that he wanted to do something on the great reversals of the scripture um, or the butts of the Bible, um, I had just read Samson's story and I had just read verse 22, but the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Dr. Horton suggested that I was just choosing this passage to help my dad move product. He did a series for Ligonier on the life of Samson, and so he's actually here today and maybe even has some in his trunk if you want to buy them later. Um, but that's not, why we, that's not why I chose this passage. That's not why this passage came to mind. I've always found Samson to be a fascinating character. I found him to be a fascinating character when I was in Sunday school. Uh, probably many of us did as kids who grew up in the church, hearing about Samson and his feats of strength. Somehow Sunday school didn't touch on the prostitute's part. Um, but his story was, Im was impressive to children, I think, especially. And then as you grow older, you start to w say, now, wait a minute. Why is he a good figure? And he's definitely a good figure in the Bible because he appears in Hebrews 11. Um, when we have that, that passage, it's often referred to as the heroes of the faith, the cloud of witnesses whose faith and lives bore testimony to what they believed and who have God's testimony or commendation about them from heaven that he is not ashamed to be their God. The, the author of Hebrews says, you know, I wish I had time to tell you about Samson. Uh, as one of these people, this, one of these people who is part of this cloud of witnesses, whose testimony is to be heard about how the Lord works and how we can overcome by faith, who's an encouragement to us to keep on. And as I got older, I thought, now, how is he an example of faith? There seems a lot in Samson's life that would be a cautionary tale, uh, not one that would be commended to us as a testimony to be heard. But that's how God's word speaks to us. It tells us that his life speaks. He testifies to us. There's a testimony in it. And that testimony is to be listened to. And I want to think about what does his life testify to us this morning. Now, there's many things we could say about Samson and about his life, but in the short time that we have, I'd like to talk about how God can make sinners strong out of weakness. His life testifies to us how God can make sinners strong out of weakness. Um, and I just want to think with you briefly about the source of his great weakness and the source of his great strength. What was the source of Samson's great weakness? What was Samson's great problem in life? It wasn't a haircut. Right? His great problem in life was divided loyalties. That really was the story of his life. His problem was that he was a, a victim of divided loyalties when he had been called to a life that in a particular way was to show singular loyalty to his God. Right? He, he says in our passage that he was to be a Nazarite from birth. And we know if we read number 6 that Nazarite vows were not intended to be per permanent things for most people. They were a temporary personal commitment you made for a time. But in that temporary personal commitment, you were giving a picture of what Israel's perpetual national commitment should look like to the Lord. A singularity of commitment, a singularity of purpose in being committed to the Lord. And maybe one of the most famous parts of that vow in the story of Samson's life is, is the part of that that requires you not to allow a razor to shave your head, to, cut, to touch your hair. Um, maybe all of us way back in the pandemic when barber shops were closed, we were all living hashtag that Nazarite life. We couldn't go and get... <laughs> You know, we couldn't get our hair cut, and we were all experiencing what it is to just let it flow. And one of the reasons that was part of that vow, to just let your hair flow, was to, because hair growing is just a symbol of life. And that, that hair, unrestricted, unrestrained, uncut by human hands, was to be a picture of a life that was lived like that before God. Unrestrained, uncut, uncontrolled by anyone. And that, that, in a sense, was to be not just Samson's temporary commitment, but his lifelong commitment, the one that he's probably most famous for. Um, and, and why was that, in particular, his calling? Because he was called to stand out in the midst of a nation full of people that had forgotten that perpetual commitment to the Lord that God's people were to have. 
Samson comes on stage in his story at a time where God's people had made peace with living under the dominion of God's enemies. They, they just sort of even fail to question it anymore. They're living under God's enemies and they've made their peace with that. They even criticize Samson at certain points saying, you know, you're wrecking the peace. And Samson, in a particular sense, was called by God to wreck that peace. And he was very effective at that job. And his hair was a symbol of who he was to be. Someone who stood exclusively under God's control and no one else's. Who was at perpetual, perpetual war with God's enemies. And he certainly behaved in self-centered and self-gratifying ways as a judge of Israel, but two things about his reign were clear, and I think they're nicely summarized by F.F. F. Bruce, that he was deeply conscious of the invisible God and of his own call to be an instrument in God's hand against the enemy. He was deeply conscious of the invisible God and of his own call to be an instrument in God's hand against the enemy. Whatever else we might say about Samson, he understood that God was the power, that he was the hammer, and the Philistines were the nails. And he lived that life that way. And his hair was a symbol that no one will control him but God. That his life was entirely in God's hands, that God had the reins of him. Um, he had control over his life, and as long as that was true as long as he was singularly committed to that same cause that was God's and his hair was a symbol of that. As long as that continued, there wasn't any one man or beast that could stand in front of him. You could bring 30 men, you could bring a thousand, it wouldn't matter. You couldn't, he couldn't be stopped. Didn't matter if it was a lion, he could tear it apart like he would a young goat with his bare hands. It didn't matter, he couldn't be stopped. His hair was a symbol of that. But there came a time in his life where we read about in this passage that he exchanged his warfare against God's enemies for making peace with living under their dominion. He did exactly what the people of God had been doing all around him. He made peace with coming under the dominion of God's enemies. Um, he forfeited his strength by sharing the secret of his strength giving his whole heart to someone he shouldn't have given his whole heart to. That allegiance that should have been just for God, he gave it to someone else. He turned over the secret of his great strength, and he did exactly what the Israelites had done. He willingly acquiesced to putting himself under the dominion of God's enemies. And, and the hair was not really the problem, but the hair had been a symbol um, and when he forfeited that symbol, when he forfeited that hair, when he forfeited that symbol of God's exclusive control over his life, um, he lost not only the hair, but the strength, the freedom, his eyes, and for a time, the powerful presence of the Lord. And I think we have to let the horror of what we read in the last part of verse 20 wash over us to see the source of his great weakness. What, what is the horror of the last part of verse 20? He did not know that the Lord had left him. One of the dangers about having a fine reformed education is that we might rush to make our doctrine make up for that statement. Of course the Lord didn't leave him. Let's go immediately to the canons of Dort, the fifth head of doctrine. Of course the Lord didn't leave him. But we have to let the text speak. The Holy Spirit has a reason he says this. Um, to, to, to make us feel the weight of that. That the Lord who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever, the covenant God left him. That's why he came to wreck and ruin. And as bad as the torture and the torment he went through, nothing could compare with that moment of spiritual lows in his life. For the steadfast love of the Lord to leave him for that time. That was the source of his great weakness. And he teaches us those two important truths. That we cannot allow anybody but God to direct our lives. There's a danger in having divided loyalties in this world. 
about submitting ourselves to anyone's rule but the rule of Christ by his word and by his spirit. This should be a reminder to all of us because we are all in a fight against God's enemies. Now, I'm not going to, tell, going to tell you to go out and go to war with people with a jawbone of a donkey. Um, we know that our warfare is not physical like his was. Our warfare is spiritual. But spiritual warfare is still warfare. It's warfare in which there can be no quarter given to the enemy, and we can expect none. Because the enemy is led by someone who's a murderer and a liar from the beginning. It should impress on us the seriousness of, of the battle that we're in and the dangers that we face. But we shouldn't just forget the source of his great weakness. We should remember the source of his great strength. Uh, 20, verse 22 offers us such hope. And this is where to locate the hope after you've, you've pressed home. The, the horror of verse 20. The hope comes in verse 22. His hair began to grow again. His hair began to grow again. The Lord had left him for a time, but the Lord does not forsake his own. Um, just as his hair was connected with the Lord with him, uh, the hair returns. Um, that the Lord may have left him for a time, but the Lord has not forsaken him. Friends, remember that when you minister to people. You're going to minister to people through all, in all walks of life who've had serious falls into sin and are going to feel as if the Lord has left them. Um, and we need to remind them that although the Lord may withdraw that sense of his presence with us for a time, certainly when we are involved in serious sin, he does not forsake his own. And here is where I would go to the fifth head of doctrine in the canons of Dort and remind people of the way God restores those who's fall, who have fallen into serious sin. Uh, you remember that too, should you fall into serious sin. That the Lord may leave us for a time to make us feel the weight of how we failed him, but he will never leave us or forsake us to the end. And that's what the end of Samson's life reminds us. We have this terrible scene of of Samson bent and broken, um, brought out in the middle of a festival to celebrate the victory of their God over Samson. And I hope, as you noticed, as I read, I tried to emphasize all of those first-person plurals that come across in their praise. Our enemy, our God, our hand, the ravager of our country, let him entertain us. They are undivided in their loyalty to their God. And Samson is in a position where he can do nothing but hear this. Right? All he can do is hear what's happening around him. Hear that praise raised up. And what does Samson know? He knows this has nothing to do with their God. He knows this, that this has everything to do with his God. Um, and he hears all of this praise, all of this celebrating, all of this laughter. Um, as they look on, he's entertaining. They're, they're looking and laughing. Um, he hears all of this, and that causes him, that kindles in him a desire for vengeance, a desire for justice. And so many people have turned to his prayer and said, is this a prayer that should be emulated? There's a lot of ink spilled in commentaries on judges, either saying this is kind of a petty prayer, for, for vindictiveness, but it happens to dovetail with God's purposes, so God listens to the prayer. Other people want to totally defend what he says here as his desire for God's name to be vindicated, that this is not a personal desire for revenge, but a desire for the name of the Lord to be vindicated. I, I think it's probably part, partly both. Um, it can't be per purely personal desire because James tells us if we simply pray to want to spend on our own sinful desires, the Lord doesn't grant that prayer. Um, but brothers and sisters, we'd be in a pretty pitiable state if God only heard prayers that proceeded from pure motives. Um, I hope you know that. If you don't, let me tell you. We'd be in a pitiable state if the purity of our prayers made all the difference. What is the truth that we live under? What is the truth that we celebrate? We have a high priest in heaven who intercedes for us. 
who takes our prayers in the imperfection with which they're offered and sanctifies them and brings them in perfection to the throne of his Father who reigns in power and who loves his children. Some of the commentaries that were really getting into sort of the pettiness of Samson's anger for their eyes, I thought, let someone pluck your eyes out and see how you feel about it. But I also thought, no matter how petty or vengeful his desire might have been, it pales in comparison to the holy anger of God against the Philistines who plucked the eyes out of his deliverer. One of his children who was the apple of his eye. And and Samson calls out, and his prayer could not be more different than the prayers that are raised by the Philistines. Our God, our enemy, our hand. How does he begin his prayer? Adonai Yahweh. Normally when we translate Adonai, we don't bring out that that my that's built into it. It's, It's rare to bring that out in the translation. This might be a time to do it. Like in Psalm 16, I say to Yahweh, you are Adonai, you are my Lord. Maybe that's a time to do it here. When all around him are calling on their God to call out and say, my Lord, Yahweh. Remember me. Strengthen me that I may be avenged for my eyes. It's a prayer that whatever its imperfection amounts to, allow me once again to fight with you and for you against those who are your enemies and the enemies of your people. This one last time. And it it shows that some of that divided loyalty has washed away because he's now wholly committed in his life to this cause. Let me die with the Philistines. Let me give my life in this service. And God answered the prayer of faith. And God made Samson strong out of weakness. And when he toppled that building, he made him more effective in enforcing justice in his death than he ever had been in his life. And Samson died in faith. And he entered into glory And he joined the cloud of witnesses who testify to us that they have conquered the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Samson has received God's commendation as one of whom the world was not worthy. He testifies to us that God can make sinners strong out of weakness despite their failures by his grace. May we all listen to his testimony. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the cloud of witnesses you've given who testify to us of those who can have faith in your promises and who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and who continue to tell us as we run our race that the race can be won, that the obstacles can be overcome, and who not only testify to us but have received your approval that you testify to us that even despite all of his sin and failure, Samson was someone of whom you're not ashamed to be called his God, and that the world was not worthy of one such as him. We thank you for what you can do for us by the blood of the Lamb, by the word and the testimony of Jesus Christ. We pray that we might listen to these witnesses and live lives of service to you. Hear us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.